Hello, I'm Stephanie Quine with the Weekly Law Report. Courts are often described as slow-moving bastions of conservatism. The law is almost always one step behind technology, but what about the courtroom itself? In this special edition of the Law Report, we look at developments in legal technology and how effective they are in Australian courtrooms. In New South Wales, uh, you've got the Supreme Court and the Federal Court, and they're building in Queen Square. They have um, a lot of infrastructure and dedicated electronic courtrooms. The majority of the courtrooms have um, a, what they call Style 1 technology, which enables uh, transcription in, in, of the proceedings. And then it goes all the way up to video conferencing and evidence presentation. For legal document processing firm Law & Order, output has traditionally been hard copy. Thousands of pages of evidence are still printed here. A CD duplicator makes hundreds of exact copies, particularly for class actions. But more and more evidence is being processed onto hard drives. Printing has shifted to scanning. Low-cost PCs and servers search up to 10 million documents per matter, converting files into court-approved digital formats. Parties exchange if, uh, electronically if they've got over 500 documents. Then uh, they're asked to actually basically look at what they're exchanging and cull it back. And it really depends on the jurisdiction. There's already uh, a large amount of funds going into the production of the evidence electronically. So the next step is to actually reuse that in the courtroom. This is one of the most modern court complexes in New South Wales and across the country. It was here that the state's first terrorism trial took place, with 15 accused and 36 defence counsel present at the one time. Electronic facilities for digital evidence presentation, remote testimony and audio and visual conferencing have helped to save tens of millions of dollars in the last six to seven years. Of the uh, participants that come to court now, nearly 60% of them come by video conferencing and that represents about 64,000 uh, video conferencing sessions that would be held in New South Wales courts across the course of a year. By bringing people in by video conferencing, one, you, you make the process more efficient. You're not waiting for people to come up from cells and to be taken back down again. They can be uh, scheduled to come quickly one after the other. It means that you're not moving people around, which is both uh, a courtesy and a comfort to those people who are in custody, as well as an efficiency in not having to, or a risk to their escape. Questions are asked, do people appearing by video link really appear in a court? Is this really participation in a court process? But I think we've moved past that these days, and um, it is just such a practical way of, of uh, dealing with people's participation in, in the justice system. But Phil Greenwood, a Sydney-based barrister, has some reservations about remote testimony. It's great when it's not a really important witness and their testimony isn't critical and that well, what they're saying isn't going to be challenged in terms of whether they're telling the truth or not. If I was going to be cross-examining you, would you rather be at a distant location, far away from me? Well, I'm sure you would. So that illustrates its advantage for a vulnerable witness, for example, but also its weakness for a capable witness and wanting to actually attack a capable witness. You want them there in the courtroom so the judge can smell their response. When it comes to presenting evidence in court, digital technology can help to enhance a judge and jury's understanding. By showing it in a in a screen on the desk of both the defence and prosecution and, as you saw, in the jury box, they can see the, the reality of the evidence quite, quite clearly. To be able to illustrate it, not just with a photo, a small photo, but to be able to blow it up, to have a video or, um, as I've done in one case, to be able to bring in some technology like an electron microscope, to be able to then put that up on a big screen and show the judge the internal workings of a computer. It sometimes can take the case away from just being down here on a piece of paper to actually being alive and being real. But technology can sometimes be overused in a courtroom. Our judicial system doesn't like fancy presentations. It's a pitfall to try and do something that's got too much technology. I've only been at the bar 32 years and people have been saying that almost the whole time, that we'll move to a paperless office. I don't see it happening anytime soon.
With the paper at least, the judge is able to see the different columns, the different column headings, and I can take the judge to the relevant parts of the document relatively easily. He or she can mark them and have them as a permanent record rather than them being lost by referring to them on the screen. As always with technology, the challenge is to keep up. Mobile technology that's really starting to be open up a wealth of opportunities for us and I think we need to get down that path pretty quickly. Frankly, there's no point in having all this technology in the courts if people don't know how to use it. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. You've got to have the demand to then have the supply of the equipment and the people to control it. Court processes are a key concern in the Productivity Commission's current review of the cost of access to justice. Sophisticated thinking about the use of technology in the justice system will no doubt lead to greater efficiencies. I hope you enjoyed this special report. Please send your thoughts and comments to the address below. Don't forget you can follow Lawyers Weekly on Twitter, like us on Facebook and join in discussions on LinkedIn. I'm Stephanie Quine. Bye for now.